Hi everyone, welcome to this video. This is something I've wanted to do for a little while and it's not something I've tried on my channel before. But this is a relatively new game that um, launched a few years ago that I've really enjoyed playing. And in the last few sort of months we've had a few people locally, a few more people locally start to take an interest in it. So I thought what I could do is do a short series of videos on what the Baron's War is and how you play it. There are some other videos out there on uh, YouTube. I know the guys over at Footsaw did a very good and a very professional video on um, how um, coherency works and movement, I think it was. But there's not been any video since then, which is a bit of a shame. I know there's um, a channel called Wormwood Studios, I believe it is. They've started doing something similar recently where they're looking at how you play the game. So I definitely recommend checking them out because they're probably going to be way ahead of me in terms of sort of like knowledge of the rules and also getting videos out. But what I wanted to do is just go through in a handful of videos what this is, how it plays, and explain why I like it so much. If it can get even a handful of people interested in playing the game, then personally, I'll consider that a success. So the Baron's War rules, these initially started as a Kickstarter back in September 2017. Um, I believe it was a range of miniatures followed by a, a rule set. It's then expanded a couple of times. There's the Death and Taxes rule set, there's a Conquest rule set, and there's also an Outremer rule, rule set. At the moment, there's rumours of an um, Anarchy rule set coming as well. Each of these rule sets um, fit into the main rule book, so the main rules don't change, but they add in different characters, different uh, weapon types, different abilities, all to fit into those different periods. So... The Baron's War, the core rule set, is based on the Civil War um, fought in England between 1215 and 1217. Essentially, the war between King John and his barons, because King John wasn't a particularly nice bloke. The barons took up arms, arms against him and invited the Prince of France over to England to become a king. Uh, a couple of years of war went past, lots of people dying, lots of battles, lots of, lots of sieges, and the war finally started to come to an end because King John died of dysentery. The core mechanics of the game, very simple. Um, they are easy to learn, but they offer quite a lot of tactical depth. Um, there's a lot of movement. Um, groups are activated one at a time. So you have to consider not just what you're doing with your group, but what your opponent will be doing with their group at the next activation. So it's really good fun. It's easy to learn. And it's relatively, compared to some um, war games producers, one, some war games companies, relatively cheap to buy into. The main rule book, um, I think they've got it on special offer at the moment, but the main rule book's no more than, I think, between 10 and 15 pounds. And a beginner retinue, which is a 500 point list, um, is going for about 50 to 60 pounds, I think, on the Foot for Store, Foot Store website. So if you are interested, I definitely suggest checking them out. There's also a Facebook group, which I'll provide links to as well. So first things first, what do you need to be able to play the game? Well, it's a miniature war game. So first off, you need miniatures. But Saw produce a very good range of 28 millimeter miniatures. They cover the majority of the units that they produce in the game. Um, there are some gaps. For example, um, they don't do um, a full range of weapons for certain types of troops. So um, sergeants, um, you've got, you can see here, sergeants with falchions, or you've got sergeants with um, spears, but you don't have sergeants with two-handed weapons. So you will either have to find a proxy for that, or you'll have to sort of like kit bash something or make something fit. The miniatures themselves, they are, they use, the game uses two different base sizes, and this keeps it very simple. 25 millimeter round base for infantry and a 25 by 50 millimeter pill base for cavalry. There's no movement trays, there's no um, formation blocks or anything like that. They all operate on their individual base. So, in that respect, it's very easy to do. And also, people who are playing, I think, Saga uses a similar sort of basing scheme. Um, middle earth strategy battle game similar basing 25 millimeter round uh, not so much for cavalry but still plenty of overlap with other games as it's a skirmish rule set 
It's also not a very big game, so games can be fought with as few as 15 models per side. Each model, of course, has a points value, so you can go from sort of like 500 points up to 1,000 or even more if you wanted to. The higher the points value, the longer the game is probably going to last. So what else do you need? Miniatures, the rule book. The core rule book contains everything you need to know on how to play the game. The other books, Death and Taxes, um, Conquest, Outremer, and when it probably comes, the Anarchy book, they supplement the rule book. So you will need the main core rule book to be able to play it as well, which is available on the Futsal website. The game itself uses three different types of dice. So first off, and the most common that you'll use, is a D10. This is used for things like um, archery attacks, uh, melee attacks, morale checks, anything where you have to check your statistic against um, the profile, the majority of the time it uses one of these. You will also need some D6s. These are not used as often, but they do come into play um, with things like when you are charging, when you're measuring distances um, to see whether you can charge far enough, you use a D6 rather than a D10. The final one is some morale dice. These are effectively just fancier D6s. So you could, if you want to use a D6, but these are numbered on each side and they're used to denote to keep track of a unit's morale score. So these are available on the Futsal website. As are these D6s, people have probably got most of them laying around somewhere anyway. The game uses a token system to denote which units have activated. You can either get these for free from the Warhost website, Warhost being the online aspect of uh, Futsal Miniatures, I believe. So you can go there to get the FAQs, you can go there to get um, sort of free downloads that they've created. You can also buy these in MDF. So I have picked up some of these up myself. So you've got a move token, which is this green fellow on a horse. You've got an attack token, which is this guy cutting down his foe. You've got a defense token, which is these guys forming a shield wall. You've got a command token, which is this banner. You've got an ability token, which is this king. There's a weary token, which is these guys looking pretty glum and pretty defeated. There's a broken token, which these, these guys, I don't know if they're on the floor or running away, can't quite tell. And then the final one is a shocked token, which is this guy who's looking like he's had a few too many ales, but that's the token for being shocked. We'll go into more detail on these um, in a different uh, video when we explain sort of like how a game term, game term works, but these are the core tokens that you need to be able to play the game. You also need a tape measure. Pre-measuring is allowed in this game. Um, so use whatever you want, a tape measure, a ruler, anything. The game is played in inches, so make sure that whatever you're using to measure measures in inches as well. Now, in the rule book and available on the Warhost website is a quick reference sheet. This is very useful as you can refer to it during the game rather than having to flip through each individual page. It essentially outlines in sort of like very quick form what you do for each phase and what how to play through the game. Very useful. And I believe the one on the Warhouse website is updated regularly. You'll also need a retinue list. The Warhouse website has a retinue builder, which is very good. It's an online calculator where you can add and remove different equipment. At the moment, though, it is only really good for uh, the base Barons War rule set. It doesn't have um, doesn't have unit profiles for the Welsh, which was another expansion, actually. Um, Death and Taxes, Outremer, um, they've not been added yet. Um, there are often questions on the Facebook group about when that's coming, and the guys keep saying, it's coming soon. Don't worry too much. So I'm sure it will be out avail available soon. But otherwise, you just pen and paper, calculator, work out what your, what your uh, retinue list is going to be. The final thing you need 
is a battlefield. So the game is played on a four foot by three foot table. So it'll be four foot in width, three foot, three foot in depth, which is great if you've got a four foot by four foot mat like this or larger. The game does rely a lot on terrain. So you want to have lots of terrain on the board. So things like trees, buildings, um, fields. Um, I've got some walls, I've got fences. Um, anything which can block line of sight and can sort of like force you to move around. This is a skirmish game. It's not a rank and flank game. So Unix can be flexible moving in and out through smaller gaps than they could do if you had a sort of like a, a eight unit, eight or well, six, six models in a line having to go move together at the same pace and same direction. So it's really great in that respect in that it's a lot more flexible than some games and you can really have fun with creating your own scenarios the final thing you need and it's possibly one of the most important is to remember the code of chivalry code of chivalry no sorry can't say it doesn't matter just kill them all kill everything run them down kill them knife them mace them stab them go absolutely crazy and just enjoy the game One of the very first things in the rule book talks about general principles and rule conventions. Now, I won't go through all of these in depth, but it is a good starting point to be able to get your head around some of the uh, basic parts of the game. So as I've already said, measurements are in inches and they can be checked at any time. Each model, when it's attacking something, gets one dice. One mini is one warrior, it gets one dice. You don't have any models who have more than one attack, as you might do in other games. As they're all based on circular bases, there's no group facings. So you're not getting um, a bonus for attacking from the side, although well, technically you could, depending on how far spread out a unit is, but there's no group facings. So when you're measuring the distance between two groups, you measure from the closest miniature to the closest miniature. Just go closest to closest, and that's it. When you're attacking, you must attack the nearest visible group unless you pass a morale check or use an ability. That's one that I often forget when playing. So it's one really important one to remember. What I want to talk about now is line of sight. So line of sight is a very important concept in the game and it can impact how you want to uh, use your units and what exactly they can do. So the rule book, does have a very good section on line of sight. And I definitely say, go ahead and read that and use their diagrams to make sense of everything. I have created some diagrams of my own, which I will pop up on the screen as we go through this, but that's mainly just to sort of like explain bits and pieces of how I've understood it myself. I'll also demonstrate it on the table here just so that you can see exactly what I mean. So line of sight is judged from the center of the base of one unit to the center of the base of another unit. If you can draw a straight line between the two with nothing in the way, you've got line of sight. Line of sight can either be obscured or blocked. So line of sight is obscured if another model, unit or group is in the way. You can still see them, but something is sitting in the way. This also applies if you've got multiple units in the way who are just getting in the way. That would also obscure line of sight. Line of sight is blocked if whatever is in the way is, for example, like this, a piece of terrain. You cannot draw a line from one unit to the other unit without going through this. That means line of sight is blocked. That would mean if you're trying to shoot at them, you can't shoot. If you're trying to charge at them, you can't charge. Basically things like that. This is very useful because, as I said previously, it's a very terrain-heavy game. So if you had a unit who were trying to hide around the corner of a building here like this, you wouldn't be able to charge around the corner to get them. You'd have to move to the edge and then charge. So an army is known as a retinue. 
Regiment units are led by two different types of commander, either a knight commander, who can be a lord or a baron, or by a veteran sergeant. The different ranks have different um, sort of like inherent abilities and different stats. So having a mix of different commander types, so a lord and a veteran sergeant or a lord and a baron, can be very useful to make the most of having different commanders. Within a retinue, groups of warriors come together to form what are called groups. There is no upper limit on how many models can be in a group, but from memory, it's three for infantry or two for cavalry. They have to be larger than that. You can't have smaller groups. But on the upper limit, you can have as many as you want, as many as you can fit within your points value. Groups must all be armed with the same equipment. So if, for example, you've got a group of bowmen or spearmen, they all have to be armed with the same equipment. You cannot have a group of spearmen mixed in with well, a group which consists of spearmen and bowmen or spearmen with shields, spearmen without shields. They all have to be equipped in the same way. You can, of course, when you're modelling your units, mix it up. And I'm certainly guilty of this. Simply because I, for example, I have these spearmen here. And if I want to have a group of spearmen with shields, I don't have spearmen with shields. I've not yet glued any shields onto these guys. So I normally mix in some of these veteran sergeants and say these just count as spearmen with shields. And as, short, as long as your opponent is able to tell exactly what you are fielding and what you are trying to do, then I can't imagine anyone would have an issue with you trying to do that. Obviously, I can't speak to official tournaments, so if you are playing at a tournament or event, check with the person who's organising it just to make sure whatever you're doing is going to be legal. Another key principle of the game is something called coherency. So groups must maintain coherency whenever they take an action. If, for some reason, they don't maintain coherency, the next action they take must be a move action to bring them back into coherency. So coherency is essentially just how the units stay close together. For infantry, they must all finish within two inches of each other. For cavalry, they must all finish within three inches of each other. So I'll be showing some um, diagrams as I go through this. Again, the rulebook has got much better diagrams and much better ways of explaining it. But I've just created some which have helped me sort of like prepare for this video and also to understand the rules better myself. So I've also, for illustration purposes, created this. So say. My commander sits in the middle of the group. To be in, in coherency, the unit, the models in his group, must all finish within two inches of him. If, for some reason, the models are out of coherency, then at the start of the next turn, they must take a compulsory action, and this will be um, make more sense later, a compulsory action to move themselves back into coherency which, if you've got a unit which only has one action, is a bit of a bummer because that means their only action has been used to move closer together. So, 2-inch coherency for infantry. For cavalry, it is 3 inches. So, command is in here. Um, well, you have to excuse me because the... I don't have any other knights, on, knights to hand. But that is incoherency, incoherency, not incoherent. These is out of coherency. So the first move, they would have, first thing they have to do is take an action to move back together. So returning now to line of sight. As I said previously, hindered line of sight differs from blocked line of sight. We have an archer here trying to shoot at poor bishop here he has line of sight if you were to imagine that was from the center of the base to the center of the base he can shoot at him if you have multiple models in the same group even them in coherency as we've just discussed they cannot hinder themselves however if we extend this out a bit and we put something else in the way they can still see him, however, line of sight is hindered by this model in the middle. 
a hindered line of sight will impact either shooting or melee, regardless of whether the model sat in between them is a friend or a foe. If you are um, shooting, you will lose one attack dice. In addition, if you roll any ones on your D10, which we all know happens all the time, this causes a casualty to any friendly group in the middle. So there is a penalty for trying to shoot through your own groups. And if you roll any ones, that is a casualty. If you're charging, say the bishop was to charge through this, the bishop and his group, if he has one, would lose one attack dice for charging through an, a friendly group. He would also move this group one inch out of the way so that he could make his way through. You cannot charge through enemy groups. You can only go through friendly groups. And again, you take a penalty if you try to do so. And with this game being one miniature, one dice, it does have quite a big impact if you start to lose dice out of your dice attack pool. So I'm going to wrap it up for here. This is the first, as I said, of a little series. And I'd like to build on this a bit more and show you a little bit more about how the game works, how to prepare for a game and um, why it's so fun. So thank you for watching. What I want to cover in the next video is talking about retinue building. So this will talk about warrior profiles, what their statistic lines are. I'll give you some examples of profiles, talk through what's good about them, what's bad about them. We'll talk about abilities and equipment. And we'll talk about command groups and the command ability. Following from that, we'll look at the next video where hopefully we'll be able to show you how a round of the game works. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please like it, share it. Um, I hope that it can encourage some people to get into the game. As I've said, it's brilliant. It's lots of fun. And it's relatively cheap to buy into. So much cheaper than anything like Games Workshop. So just give them your money. Seriously, just give it to them. Thanks for watching, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.